This is your Libertarian Crusaders podcast, episode number 17. And today we have a great guest, Keith Preston. Uh, can you tell us what your pronouns are and any trigger warnings you may have? I don't have any pronouns. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, triggered by, uh, I'm triggered by people who are triggered. I think that's probably the only thing that really triggers me that, that, that harshly. I, I can get rather you know, upset about people that are triggered, but you know, so, so if you act triggered, I'll probably be triggered. But, uh, <laughs> as long as you're not triggered by anything, I'll probably be okay. Don't you think movie theater ratings are a, a form of trigger warnings? Well, I kind of like movie theater ratings because then I know what kind of movies I want to see. Like, if it's not at least an R, I probably don't want to see it. You know, I mean, I, I like R's and X and, and, and you know, NC-17s and, you know, triple X is okay, although that's so common nowadays. It's free on the Internet, so it's like, what's the point, you know? <laughs> right. But it's like, but if it's G or PG, I, pr- I figure it's probably a shitty movie, you know? So why, you know, why go? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, I think it's just assume like if it's a, adults are there, it's going to be rated R. It's adult themed. Right. 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 Um, if there's teenagers, obviously it's not adult themed. You know, it, part of our culture doesn't go to that far extreme um, to displaying contents. So I guess we kind of already have our own trigger warnings, but it's not uh, yeah. as crazy as what Well, is we've anything seen. rated G other than cartoons? I mean, it's. Uh, well, there's some pretty heinous cartoons out there nowadays, too. Yeah, so it seems yeah. like it can kind of go in both directions. Right. Well, I guess South Park is all that stuff is cartoons, and that's you know, <laughs> right. that comes close to being R for television. <laughs> they do a great job in uh, lampooning the Chinese and uh, yeah. and yeah. the NBA. Yeah. Um, so I think you have a very fascinating history uh, here locally in Richmond, and with uh, the anarchist movement, with your contribution of works or and insights and things you've seen. Um, there's a lot of people who think that uh, that we can work together, and there's a lot of people who can't. Right, in terms of like all the other anarcho factions and libertarians and identitarians. Um, now, when, now, what made you start this uh, group called Attack the System and which kind of promotes that? Oh, uh, well, let's see. What's the condensed version of that story? Uh, Attack the System was started about 20 years ago. Uh, and it was basically a mixture of people from different kinds of political backgrounds who noticed that a lot of people from dissident communities were saying a lot of the same stuff. So we had a, a group of us that were some left anarchists and some libertarian and ANCAP people and some militia, you know, like Alex Jones types or whatever the equivalent was back then and, and some others as well. And we got together and said, well, let's just start a sort of an umbrella group for you know, radicals and generally kind of a pan radical group. And, you know, what are we going to call it? What are we, you know, a lot of it was sort of a joke, you know, because the, the original name of the group was American Revolutionary Vanguard. And because the term revolutionary vanguard sounds communist to a lot of people, but then you throw American in, it sounds nationalist. So then people would see it and say, well, is this a communist group? Is this a fascist group? You know, what is it? It was like, well, well, it's really confused off the bat. Right. You know, Got to investigate. Well, we had one guy in the group that actually wanted to make a logo for us where he wanted to take a hammer and sickle and bend it into a shape of a swastika, but the rest of us thought, oh, it's probably going a little too far. No, people really will misinterpret that. So, Yeah, they do. Uh, people who advocate for malice, people who are against it, they will call you a counter-revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big term, a keyword they use, they throw around often. Um, so you started this 20 years ago. How, how many people did you know then to, to bring in with this? Oh, uh, there was the original circle around us was probably about 10, 15 people yeah. you know, from different kinds of backgrounds, none of whom are around nowadays. Right. In fact, some of them are deceased. But uh, the uh, but yeah. And then we had this was before really before the Internet. So we had a public access TV show that we did in Richmond for a few years. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I've still got tapes of that on old VHS tapes of that. You know, this was before anybody did podcast. There was no YouTube or, or any of that. I don't think podcast, yeah, I'm sure podcast didn't exist back then. Uh, you know, web, the internet was still pretty primitive back then. Uh, so it, the, we, the website itself was started in January of 2001. So that's when the f- website first went online. Wow. Yeah, so we started doing the website about almost 20 years ago, 19 years ago, something like that. And then it's just kind of spiraled since then, you know, like one, one thing after another. So I've since written about half a dozen books. And, uh, you know, I've, if, you, if you just Google my name, you find all kinds of stuff, you know, about me or by me or, you know, for me or whatever, or, or other projects I've been associated with. 
So uh, 20 years later, do you think uh, these bands of mischief anarchists can uh, work together? <laughs> well, it's interesting how that works because it's like I've, I have all these social media outlets that I run, like Facebook pages and stuff like that. In fact, that one of them just got shut down by Facebook. But um, and what I have on these pages, I, you know, some of some of these I've had Facebook pages, for example, of, say 5000 friends or whatever. And then, uh, plus, they're, I keep them open to the public, so really anybody can read them or whatever. Anybody that's, you know, surfing Facebook or anything like that. Plus, I have the website in the comments section and some of this other stuff. So it's interesting how I'll have these public forums. And these are just forums. These aren't organizations or, you know, activist groups or anything like that. But I'll have these forums where I get all these people from all these kinds of backgrounds, you know, libertarians and far left and very politically correct and you know, national socialists and all kinds of other stuff screaming at each other online. But then they'll always end up agreeing with each other on certain things as well. And like a lot of them, I know who they are, but they don't know who the others are. So they'll, somebody will post something and another person will show up and say, yeah, I agree with that. That's spot on. And I'll be like, well, you do know that guy's a Nazi and this person is an ultra progressive, you know, Hillary Clinton <laughs> or something, right? You know? So as to whether that could be transformed into an actual group, like an actual political organization or something like that, I think at, the, at least at the first convention, we would have to have armed security guards. So <laughs> I think we should just have duels, yeah. and then whoever yeah. survives is... Yeah. Wow, that's the anarchy that reigns. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not opposed to Mutual that. Mutual combat. I mean, I mean, if we could you know, just have televised, like pay-per-view sh street fights or something between the alt-right and the Antifa and all this kind of stuff, you know, I mean, why let... Monetize yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, somebody... Somewhere should be making profit. Well, so. UFC is trying to make money off of that concept by having this one guy, I forget what his name is. The Kobe, YouTuber? Colby something, Covington. And he's this Trump supporter, or he claims to be a Trump supporter. And he just creates all these beefs with all the other guys. And uh, he, he's an exceptionally good. I don't even think he really believes in the Trump stuff. But <laughs> <laughs> it's it makes him money, at least. Right. Well, there's going to be a good market for that because the thing is, now that everybody knows wrestling is fake, you know, they, they admit that it's <laughs> fake, you know, they're going to have to have some other venue where they can actually have the heel characters and the face characters and the feuds and the turns and all that kind of right. stuff. Right, right. I think um, having that kind of convention would take forever. I mean, you, you saw what, what they did with, and that was it Atlanta? What, what, what was that convention? Democratic Socialist Convention. Democratic Socialist, Socialist Convention. Yeah. Like, they couldn't even go through any questions between before anyone saying, personal point of privilege, uh, <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> I oh, yeah, can't the hear. D yeah, the DSA convention, the one that was streamed online, the one where they were saying, well, there was one person that was saying that clapping, like noise, was, right. they, was, they were noise sensitive. And then the other one said, well, don't forget, don't, don't use gendered pronouns. So they have to, yeah, they have to do a little finger wave thing to acknowledge their presence or whatever. How can you ever get any sort of work done? Like, how can you ever have an agreement with anybody ever? Well, apparently, though, there was actually a DSA gathering. I forget where it was, but it was just recently, within the last week or so. It was the DSA and associated groups, like some of the Ancon types, and some Maoists showed up in, in red masks and just beat the hell out of them. You know, because <laughs> what? They're, well, because wow. they're revisionists. They're revisionists. <laughs> you know, they're they're counter-revolutionary running dogs of imperialism. So, right. Wow. You know. Uh, what are some groups you just would not work with? Well, I go by more individuals than, yeah. than groups. I, I don't really care what a person's philosophy or ideology is. I mean, I know people who believe all kinds of stuff that I think is crazy. Flat earthers, you know, or... Um, Wait, yeah. what's wrong with flat earth? <laughs> <laughs> if you think the earth is flat, you think the earth is flat. You know, or the, the ancient astronaut theory, you know, that's another one. The moon landing was a hoax. It's uh, nine, all the different species of 9-11 truth and as well as all the different sectarian ideological perspectives. You know, it's like, I, it's, it's interesting in knowing so many people with these kinds of ideas because it's like it, you find people that are actually really insightful about certain things, are very, you know, woke on certain things. But then, then even if you think their other ideas are insane, you know, because I guess they're saying the same thing about me too. So, <laughs> yeah. but, but it all comes down to the individual person. You have a background that came from the left. Mm -hmm. now, how did that uh, occur and how did you? Evolve out of that or well, read uh, out of that? Well, uh, I don't know that I evolved out of it as much as I just built on top of it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the, uh, let's see, how did that start? I, yeah, I, I was in the radical left in the 80s. Hanging out with Ancoms. Yeah, well, they didn't really call themselves Ancoms. Well, so it was Murray Rothbard, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, Murray Rothbard was still alive then. And, uh, and Murray, Murray Bookchin, I actually met Murray Bookchin once. Mm. Uh, 
probably about 30 years ago, something like that. It was a 1991, so 28 years ago. Mm. Uh, Yeah, so, yeah, I was part of the far left. I was in the IWW. uh, International Workers of the World. Industrial Workers of the World. Were you part of Black Bloc? Did you go to no, Seattle? No, Black Bloc didn't come about until a little bit later. Uh, Black Bloc, they got really popular in the 90s, right? Yeah, More Black Bloc came along maybe about 10 years after I was into all this. After I, I, was in the, I was in the IWW in the late 80s, early 90s. And then the Black Bloc thing, that came along back when the Seattle Battle of Seattle and all the yeah, uh, anti-globalization the protests were starting. G20? Yeah, and all that IMF. kind of stuff. Yeah, all that kind of stuff was big for a while in radical scenes. Every time the IMF or World Bank or any of those groups would meet, meet. you'd have a big mass protest against them. Yeah, so I was, but I, in the late '80s, early '90s, I was, uh, I was in IWW. I used to be on the international, uh, well, the national committee of uh, an anarcho-syndicalist international. If you've ever heard of the International Workers Association, it's the one that includes the CNT from the, the Spanish Civil War uh, from mm-hmm. that time period. But I was mm-hmm. I was on the national committee of the American section of that of the of the international. Uh, let's see what else was I into back then? Because they they like to trace their roots to like that international what, socialist commune or anarchist thing in France and yeah first yeah the history yeah right. yeah Something the first like international. We've well, got you had the first internet. I mean the really first international from the eighteen seventies. It was Karl Marx and Bakunin right. and all those people. Then they had the split and. Then you started having the all these different other internationals. The uh, you know, like there was an anarchist international. I guess the IWA is is still the same that I belong to. I guess it's still the same anarchist international of the early twentieth century. I mean, it's, I think it's been the same basic mm-hmm. group for you know a century or so. But then you also have all the Leninist internationals and the Trotskyist internationals, and you know the third, fourth, and fifth internationals and whatever. And uh, so, what work brought you to? I guess. Build it off of a leftist uh, identitarian. Uh, well, let's see. I, uh, I well, one thing that I thought was interesting was when I was involved in the left anarchist milieu, and, and I was part of the general left as well. I started noticing how many different types of anarchism there were. Yeah, I'm like, well, there's not really just one type. It's like all these different. It's like Christianity or something. Right. It's like you've got all these different denominations. And I started looking at other philosophies. Like I started looking at libertarianism, you know, I started reading like Murray Rothbard and, and uh, Robert Nozick and, and some of those kinds of people and, and started, you know, thinking I liked some of their ideas, maybe didn't like others, but that was okay. And then I started looking at all kinds of other, you know, I was always interested in fringe ideas, you know, so I started looking at all these other fringe political ideas as well as cultural ideas as well. You know, like, I, like I remember discovering the sovereign citizens. I'm like, I'm like, well, they're like anarchists, but they mean it. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, boy, do they mean it. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, number one, a police. Every uh, police video, training video is like, beware of these guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, like take lessons, you know. But uh, yeah, so I started thinking that, you know, it's uh, that it, I started moving away from any kind of sectarian outlook. I started thinking, well, you know, all this stuff is very similar to each other, but different in other ways as well. And I started looking at movements like that in other countries and in, in Europe and in Asia and places like that, you know, like uh, third positionism, national anarchism and national Bolsheviks. Like, what is all this stuff? You know, it's like, I never heard of this stuff. Before. Yeah. This wild stuff, you know, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and that led into more or less what I've been doing for the last 20 years is like, you know, just kind of creating an umbrella for all these different kinds of fringe movements and that kind of thing. What do you uh, identify now? Uh, I'm just me. <laughs> <laughs> How would you define anarchism? Uh, oh, well, well, I, whenever somebody asks me that, the first thing I'll always say, make is a qualification. And I'll say that uh, if you put 200 people that claim to be anarchists in the same room <laughs> and ask them the question, what is anarchism? You're going to get 500 answers by the time <laughs> the discussion is over. All right, so that's the first thing, all right? So uh, I would say that, you know, it's basically just, it, it, anarchism is distinguished from other philosophies, I think, first and foremost, of being against the state. You know, it's the only philosophy that says we reject the state. We don't still believe in the state as an institution. There's no other political ideology that believes that. Uh, and then you, you have all the other qualifiers. Again, I'd, I'd say it's kind of like Christianity. If you ask somebody uh, if they're a Christian, they say, what does that mean? You say, what does that mean? Well, who knows? You know, it depends on what kind of denominational affiliation. You know, we believe in Jesus, you know, but what does that mean to you? Well, it could be anything. But, uh, 
But so I'd say anarchism is more about, uh, for me, it's just more about being against the state in favor of a voluntary society based on free association and voluntary cooperation and individual association and all these kinds of things. And you can just take it, you know, from there or however you want. I was, I was spent a moment in a, uh, or I started a Facebook uh, page called Libertarian Shitlords for Marianne Williamson. And, uh, I, I started getting into all these like Marianne Williamson groups and stuff and it was weird. It was just a weird experience because I started interacting with like far left people that I never interact with online. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing how many uh, like similar beliefs they have. And then yet we'll get into something and they'll, and they'll be like, Oh, and by the way, like Rand Paul is a uh, massive Nazi or something. Oh, wow. Like, <laughs> and you're just like, uh, oh, okay. And, it, it, and so think, it's amazing. I, what I don't understand is how do, you, how do you get all these competing groups, these radicals, they're radicals for a reason. How do you get them to, to uh, coalesce around just a simplified definition of anarchy, you know? Well, a lot of people that I deal with politically are not, don't really identify as anarchists. I, I talk to people all up from all over the spectrum, all kinds of you know, views, including stuff I consider just really way out. You know? But um, uh, I don't know that there's any one right way to be an anarchist, though. I, what I gen generally promote is a, more, uh, is, is a more practical idea, which is the idea of you go your way and I'll go my way. Like I call it pan-secessionism, which is basically, I, 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 I developed that idea by looking at all these different sovereign citizen groups and militia groups back in the 90s that wanted to break the United States up into all these different little countries like Republic of Texas and stuff like that and you know the Lakota Republic and the Cascadia and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, that's a pretty interesting idea. So let's just extend that out where we have all these different anarchical tribes, you know, like you're, a tra you're an anarcho-transhumanist, so you want lots of technology and robot, you know, robot humans and that kind of stuff. Then, <laughs> but then you're this other person over here. Go to here, Canada. Yeah, but this other person over here is an anarcho primitivist. So they want to live like you know the the caveman or whatever. All right, so right. You, you go to the caves and then you go to the you know the seastead <laughs> or the the space colony or whatever. Uh, so the, the concept of pan secessionism that was something that always people seem to get confused by because they they think it's some big elaborate detailed philosophy or something like. No, it's not any of that. It's just a tactical concept. You know, it's like, like somebody asked me once, they said, what are the basic tenets of pan-secessionism? Like, that's like saying, what is the basic tenets of, you know, signing a petition or, you know, voting or something or making a bomb or whatever. You know, it's, a, it's just a tactical concept. You know, like a general strike. I'll ask, like, anarchists from the left, I'll say, well, you know what a general strike is, right? right? They're like, yeah, sure, you know, workers just stop working and a lot of, you know. I'm like, what's well, so pan-secessionism is? You just, you just stop cooperating with the system, period. Right. I think a tenant would be uh, respect for property rights because these communities wouldn't be able to uh, collaborate or um, at least respect each other's communities and not to interfere if they didn't respect the property rights boundaries, borders of their communities. Yeah, and then that gets down to the question of what are property rights and who, who gets what, basically. Right, you and know? that goes forever with, like, Ancoms and Ancidiclus. <laughs> right. Well, my, my take on that is pragmatic. I, I would say that, you know, property rights and territorial rights or whatever you want to call it are, uh, you know, I mean, all that is is just a synonym for resource allocation. You know, it defines who, you, know, you, have, you have some system of determining who gets what, whatever it is. I mean, like even people that claim they don't believe in private property of any kind, period, they still believe in private property of some kind because you still have to have a private property to have a commune on, you know, so it's like, right. you know, so the property is, it's the property of the, of the commune. Or like, see, even in a, a, a state that claims to not recognize private property, like Marxism, Leninism, right? like North Korea, where they've got tons of private property, right? Right. You've got, you know, like only the royal family, which is, you know, what the Kims are, only they can have access to this or whatever. So, but I, yeah, I, tend to, I tend to have a non-universalist definition of territorial rights or property rights in the sense that it basically just comes down to localized agreements by localized groups. You know, like, okay, that's your turf, and that's your turf, and that's your turf. You know, it's like, in a way, they all become ANCAPs then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying... More like, more like street gangs. I actually think street gangs are a better analogy because it's like, you know, let's say you've got a big city, L.A. or whatever, and you've got hundreds of street gangs arguing about, okay, well, who's going to sell heroin on, in this neighborhood or whatever. Okay, that's your corner, that's your corner, that's your corner, that's your corner. Let's right. Work it out. You, know? you homestead that area, I'll respect the property risk boundaries of your community if you respect mine, right? Mm -hmm. um, how uh, likely 
do you see uh, secession in general happening in uh, America? Uh, well, n- not any time in the foreseeable future. Uh, yeah, this is, I get asked that about, about that all the time because I always get people, uh, every day I get people sending me stuff about the war is coming, the civil war is coming. <laughs> uh, what, is not? <laughs> <Yeah. Boogaloo>, no? <laughs> well, no, I get, right. I know a lot of people who think there's going to be a civil war, there's going to be a revolution, there's going to be a coup, they're going to, you know, vote some <laughs> populist party into office that's going to set everything right, and left and right people believe that. Um, now, what I actually think the future of the United States is going to be is we're going to become more and more of a third world model society in the sense of you're going to see uh, huge divisions between socioeconomic groups. Um, and you're going to see the level of efficiency and effectiveness that you see in underdeveloped societies traditionally. Like a good, uh, a good um, bellwether for this, I guess, is what's going on in California right now. Yeah. Like in California, you have, you know, the super rich, you know, in the Bay Area and, and LA and, and all of that kind of stuff, just like everywhere. And then you have the middle class, the upper middle class of technocrats and bureaucrats and tech workers and professionals and the public sector and all that. But then you also have the ranks of the very poor growing. Uh, including the very, very poor. Like you're starting to see more and more masses of people living on the street like India or somewhere like that. And yeah. you're starting to see medieval diseases become commonplace again, typhus and leprosy and all that kind of stuff. There's actually been cases of that. Um, and then what Americans think of as the middle class, which is really just an upper strata working class, but that is starting to become de- depleted. So you're not going to really have that as much anymore. You know, you're going to have more of a, you know, which, well, people say third world, but really traditional model society, because historically most societies were this. You would have the super rich, and then you have the king's court and the clergy and the you know, gentry and aristocracy. Then you have the masses of peasants and servants and slaves and peons and indentured servants and all that. And that's a kind of, you know, we're developing a, um, you know, a high tech cyber revolution model of that today, but very stra- highly stratified society. So I think that's going to be the, the, the future of the United States. That's the way things are moving. But the interesting thing about it is, uh, what's that quote from the Declaration of Independence about people will take a lot before they do anything about it? It's not the, that's not the quote, but it's, mm. it means that. Right. But uh, yeah, I, I think, I think th- there's a, things, like, things have to go much further in that direction. And people have to get a lot more pissed off before they actually do anything. Like when people today say, well, the Democrats or Republicans are going to have a civil war. I'm like, yeah, right. You know, it's like a bunch of middle class, you know, tech workers and public sector bureaucrats, you know, <laughs> that make, you know, $85,000 a year. They're going to, you know, pick up an AR-15 and start shooting at each other. I guess, right. you know, well, I, think, I wanted Elizabeth Warren, you know. I don't think <laughs> civil war is a shooting war necessarily. Civil, I think that these people, what is going on right now, it could be classified as a civil war. There are, like, suppressing certain forms of speech in subversive ways that most people can't even notice. Like, they're trying to remove civility like they're trying to remove discussion from everyday conversation no there's definitely a civil war going on they're trying to remove civility well there's always been censorship though i mean or efforts to suppress popular ideas i mean the idea that that's new in the united states is, is but not everybody has had access to put their ideas out there and then it yeah. been taken away uh-huh. so i think that them trying to take that away that that could cause some sort of a an angst yeah, well, it's like the, I hear from a lot of the Second Amendment crowd, they, they say, well, you'll take my guns from my cold, dead fingers. And that Bullets may be true. first. Yeah, but they, that may be true, but a lot of those people are, are they'll probably get shot before they shoot anyone. You know, it's, uh, you know, like a lot of the Second Amendment groups are actually full of cops and, and you know, flag worshipers and, and, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff as well. So I don't really see that as it being. Yeah, and real. just the reality of the police being employees of the state. Um, picturing their wife and kids starving to death because they won't enforce these gun laws, right? right. Like, like, yeah, right. Yeah. I'd rather feed my kid and my wife rather than worry about, um, you know, I mean, other people I'm shooting and taking yeah. together. But guns. Americans, I think civilians own like 43 percent of all the guns and weapons in the world. Yeah, and did you not true. see what happened in Mexico? What in that town just last week? Uh, so uh, it, 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 uh, Chapo's uh, son was uh, detained by the army. He was going to get arrested. He, he has friends, and his friends came on a truck with like a 50 cal uh, mounted. mounted and came and just started shooting up the whole city. A lot of them came out there, and the army's like, we're done. We're going to go now. <laughs> and they let them free. Uh, so when people talk about like, you know, 
uh, yeah, we have these weapons. How could I ever stand against the government? It's like, here's a government, and <laughs> the cartel just did just that. Well, we're a long way from having something like that happen in the United right. States. But, um, but it happens in certain cities every day. Yeah. Mexico's not that far. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, too. Well, the, um, the United States is becoming more like a Latin American society over time, not less. But uh, so, you know, that might be in the distant future. <laughs> one, thing, one thing that I think is interesting, though, is that when we look at the, even at the electoral politics, Electoral politics in the U.S. now is starting to become more like what you think of as "quote unquote" third world, you know, because in the um, in, in third world elections, what you typically oh, and this is not true just in not just in the third world, but in most countries that have a so-called democratically elected government, you typically don't have just the narrow, you know, center liberal and center you know, right parties like the United States, you know, the Democrats and Republicans. You typically have a plurality of parties, but they also tend to represent a wider variety of ideas. Like you'll have a open socialists and communists and open, you know, right wing nationalists or fascists or whatever they are, uh, religious parties and that kind of stuff. And no one thinks anything of it. And, and we're starting to see like with people like Donald Trump actually getting elected or someone like Bernie Sanders. The AOC. And, yeah, yeah, all of those kinds of yeah. people, the people in Congress, they call the squad and all that. We're starting to see that come from like, the left and the right. We're starting to see a more, the kind of electoral system that you see and, and you know, well, really everywhere outside North America, you know, or, or outside the Anglosphere, you know, but like in West, in Europe and in Latin America and South Asia, India and places like that. But uh, but it's a long, that's still a long way from a civil war, though. So it's... Uh, you don't think it's happening the reverse here? They're consolidating to... These smaller groups are consolidated to one larger group uh, because uh, to consolidate into a smaller group will never win a chance. And some of these South American countries, for example, what they'll do, these groups will put their votes together to beat an opponent who clearly has more votes than them individually. Mm -hmm. um, and this happens in Bolivia. But they just had a, uh, Evo Morales just got elected again, mm -hmm. had a very close call. He's, he's running for his fourth term. Uh, my mother was out there protesting uh, here in DC, everyone's protesting against him. And she says the whole, the whole way that it's rigged down there is like, yeah, you may have most of the votes, you may seem like you're winning, but what your opponents and the other groups will do is like, we'll just combine our votes together and ally and defeat you. And then a lot of the problems in Bolivia happens, and they know that they didn't get there legitimately, and they know they're only in there for two, four years. So the first year, you'll find all the money going to these projects. Mm -hmm. They know they're not getting elected. So the next uh, two, three years, the money kind of disappears, and you have all these like abandoned buildings and construction sites, and everything kind of dries up quickly. Mm -hmm. Kind of like uh, what's happening in California, I guess. Yeah, yeah all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Trudeau just got uh, reelected, and yet uh, his party, right, is minority. Part right now, and before they, I guess they had been a majority, so they needed some help from this further left faction. But right. uh, that, and they have to make promises, right, to the to the further left factions. Okay, we'll let you do X, Y, Z, or 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 what have you. So uh, yeah, it's unfortunate, right? Right. Well, you know, and as far as the big picture goes, I think what's going on in the world today is a lot like what happened in the 19th century, in the sense that the 19th century was like today, in the sense that it's a very, it was a time of very, very rapid change. Like, back then you had the Industrial Revolution, right? it totally transforms civilization. It it's breaks down all these traditional social barriers and that kind of stuff. Marxism. And then, today, you've got the Cyber Revolution, right? You've got the... Um, you know, which is in the global economy and all of that, which is having a very similar effect to the Industrial Revolution. And, and, you, and you, in the same way, you start to see a lot of the traditional barriers broken down between, say, countries. You see large-scale migration and, and communication. I mean, just stuff like this. You know, I mean, like we wouldn't be doing this 20 years ago, right? right? So, um, but what we're also seeing is the negative as well as the positive. I mean, there's a lot of positive that came out of the Industrial Revolution, like longer life expectancy and better medicine and higher living standards and better literacy rates, but there were negatives as well. Uh, and so you started, and they cre also created a lot of social dislocations and a lot of upheavals, and you started to get, you know, riots, you know, by, and insurrections by labor unions, and you had people from the far right saying, this industrialization stuff sucks, you know, let's go back to throne and altar and, and feudalism and all that kind of stuff. And we're getting that now, you know, we're getting, like a lot of the, the populist right that yeah. we see, like these populist parties that are emerging in, in Europe and places like that, and, other, and in other places as well, it's kind of what that is. I mean, they're kind of like um, Louis Napoleon of the 21st century in the sense of, you know, maybe we've had a little too much of this modernization. Reactionary. And, yeah, exactly. Let's turn back to clock a little bit. Let's at least go back to maybe the 70s, you know, mm -hmm. if not the 50s. And maybe the 19th century wasn't so bad, you know. 
And then you're getting, you're getting stuff like that from the left as well. You know, well, let's push, push the boundaries as far as we can go. And, uh, and you know, that's why you have you know, socialism seems to be making a comeback and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and, it's, and, it's, and cultural change is becoming very rapid. Like, uh, like in the 19th century, when people started moving away from um, um, arranged marriages towards companionate marriages, you know, that was a big thing. You know, it's like, you know, you, your parents didn't just move, marry you off to some other family because the other, the other family can bring us more money into your family or something. You know, and, that, and now we have gay marriage and all of that, you know, since then, and people are saying, what the hell is happening to the world, you know, that we have gay marriage now. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's this kind of, it's the same kind of process of very rapid change that creates all these social dislocations and all these backlashes. There's a huge mo- uh, movement among like the alt-right and, and groups like that where they talk about, they really criticize corporations, capitalism, and it's a new sort of streak. It, it didn't, you know, this didn't happen 10 years ago, where uh, if you were on the right, you love capitalism, you love free market capitalism. Well, yes and no. That, that's true in the United States. Right. Um, that's not true historically. Uh, in fact, I actually wrote a book about this once. It's called Thinkers Against Modernity. That's the name of my book. But uh, what I do is I review the ideas of a number of thinkers who are anti-modernist thinkers from the right. And it's people like Nietzsche and uh, Julius Evola and, and some of those kinds, Carl Schmitt and people like that. Uh, but there's a, a vast right-wing tradition of anti-modernism, certainly, who say, no, all of this, you know, modernity, capitalism, commercial societies, industrialization, bourgeois society, as the Marxists would call it, whatever, all these things suck, you know, and this is coming from the right. This is a, a strong right-wing tradition, a European right-wing tradition, and, and not, just, not just European, but, you know, worldwide, really. It's, it's somewhat alien to Americans because... Americans were always sort of a classical liberal society. You know, America is very much rooted in English liberalism, which was the left of its time. You know, so it's, uh, but that, that tradition has always been there, but it's starting to come back to the surface once again. Right, right. Yeah, like um, I, I've, I've read uh, Tom Wood's book, uh, Church in the Market, and mm-hmm. he talks, he really uh, tries to defend capitalism and free markets to the traditionalist Catholic mm-hmm. distributists who hate, uh, you know, capitalism and the, they, they see it as, um, well, you're just uh, materialist, you know, you just want more stuff. And uh, that's a common criticism I hear from like even Tucker Carlson and, and people like that. So it's, uh, I think it's not going anywhere. You know? What about if stuff makes my life more productive so I can do more things for God? <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's probably an argument that Tom makes in there. <laughs> yeah, like, well, well, there's actually a guy now, another Catholic traditionalist, a guy named Patrick Janine, who's getting a lot of attention for, for pushing this kind of idea. That is, he calls it integralism, and it's this idea, it's basically just neo-feudalism, you know, or, or like the neo-reactionaries you know, who say, well, the world was a better place when we had an absolute monarchy that kept all these shitty peasants in line and that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, so that, but that idea is actually becoming fairly commonplace. In fact, now in the U.S., they have the uh, group, a movement called National Conservatism. Right. And yeah. it's like it's like Tucker Carlson. I mean, it's like a really watered down version of what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know? I mean, if you want the real thing, you've got to go to Europe. You know, but it's like it's an Americanized, you know, want a watered down, you know, nice middle class version of this. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, uh, pan-secessionism will look here in the United States? Like, where do, you th- where do you think, like, are these groups going, or? Um... Oh, that's a good question. Well, I don't think it's going to be what people necessarily envision. Um, for example, uh, as far as the South rising again, yeah. not going to happen. What? I, <laughs> no. I mean, I probably have Southern nationalist friends who are listening to this and saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the uh, you know, nostalgia for that is at, at an all-time low, and I don't really see that making a comeback. Mississippi oh. still has their state flag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that might be the last bastion of that. Uh, <laughs> the uh, no, I, I think it would probably be. I think past secessionism in the United States would look le- a lot le- less like the Confederacy and more like the Star Trek Federation. You know, more like uh, what's the slogan from uh, Infinite Diversity and Infinite Combinations? Like the I think that's the Vulcans, right? Or one one of those you know you know fictional yeah. futuristic species and. Yeah, so I think it would be a little more like that. It would be more like uh, things. It would you would, would see all these different kinds of identities coming out of it that we don't even uh, give much thought to today. Like we've got the transracial people now, right? Like the Dozolites, you know. <laughs> the, I call them the Dozolites. <coughs> nice. you know? Well, 
you know, I'm, I'm white, but I identify as black, or I'm, you know, I'm Mexican, but I'm really Iranian, or something like that. Right. Yeah. Tal- Talcum X, what is his name? Uh, That's all I. Oh yeah, Sean Talcum White. Sean, yeah, Sean White. Well, yeah, there's Sean a, King. Yeah, another Sean one King. is the uh, the other Brilliant kins, slip. right? The other kins. They're like the ones who think what well, we're. They think they're an animal species yeah, or right, right. furries. <laughs> well, I mean, some of this is you know I'm being kind of facetious about this, but no, I do think that in the future. When when the when the United States finally falls apart and becomes a collection of other polities, it's not going to be the usual dividing lines that we're familiar with. You know, it's not going to be well, Democrats over here, Republicans over here, and the white supremacists over here, and the you know my, Nation of Islam over here. It's not going to be that. It's not going to be those traditional dividing lines. It's going to be something you know much different. Um, so you don't see well with the federal government collapses. A lot of people say, look at the Fed and when it reaches zero, that could be a likely outcome. Where uh, things just go back to the states, right? Do you see like states also seceding from each other and breaking out to like smaller states? And- well, the thing about that though is that people talk about the divisions that exist in the United States. Well, we're so divided, and, and actually, social science research does confirm that because mm-hmm. I'm a sociologist in my professional life. Um, but it, it, the uh, the research actually shows that Americans are more politically divided on the basis of Democrats and Republicans. Than at any time since the 1870s. But how much does politics come into play in your day-to-day life? <clears throat> in, in, well, in mine, quite a bit, because I'm a political person. Right. And for the average person, I don't think it does, except for, except for when they're on Facebook and, and Twitter and TV. Right, so the, the amount that it comes into... So most of the people are going to just operate like normal, yeah. I think. Yeah, but um, the thing is, though, is that, yes, we, we have the widest political division since the post-Civil War era. And the class divisions are actually the widest they've been since the 1920s as well. Um, but it's not a geographical thing. Like they talk about the red states and the blue states, but that's not really how it breaks down. If you really look at an electoral map, for example, voting patterns and being all anarchists here, most of us probably don't vote, but I don't. But uh, anyway, um, if you look at the electoral map, you actually see that the red-blue divide breaks down more on precinct and neighborhood level yeah. than it does on, uh, certainly on state level. It's, it's closer to being a rural-urban divide. But even there, you start to see some you know, sections of cities and sections of counties and stuff like that. Well, you've got the, you know, in a county, you've got the suburbanite section of the county. You know, that's more one thing. And then you've got the more countryfied section of the county. That's another thing. So these, uh, these divisions really break down more just on a, almost to an individual level. You know, mm-hmm. like, good case in point, my parents live in a rural, upper middle class area. It's very rural, but very upper middle class. And my parents are devout Republicans. You know, my mom's got a picture of Ronald Reagan on the wall. And then they've got, she's got pictures of Robert E. Lee and all these Confederate figures. And then their next door neighbor, she has a picture of Hillary Clinton on her <laughs> yeah. wall. You know, so, you know, it's... it's At that, some point, someone's going to have to move. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, yeah, or, or I think it's going to be more of a... The, the breakdown of the system is going to be more little bands of people, you know, doing their own thing. Kind of like... Uh, you know, what, what, um, in the 19th century, you had thinkers like Paul M. Ildepute and uh, uh, Gustav Muller, Molinari, you know, the idea of panarchy and, mm-hmm. and the idea, well, you, it's really, you, don't have, you don't really have territorial governments as much as you have. I mean, you have territory in the sense you have people, some people occupy this space and some people occupy this other space. But, it's, but in terms of institutional structures, it's kind of like, say, more like the Ottomans' Malay system, like in the Ottoman Empire. You had a system where, well, the, the, the sultans were over the whole thing, so it was a, you know, it was a, it was a royal empire. But you had this system where it was, uh, they called it the Malay system, but all, the different, all these different ethnic groups and, and religious communities and tribes had their own legal systems where they sort of settled their own arguments with, among themselves. Like, so you belong to this you know, tribe or whatever, so okay, we, you, know, you stole my chickens or whatever, so I'm going to go talk to the tribal elder and say, by getting my chickens back or something like that, you know, as opposed to some, some codified system of state law. Actually, the whole system in the, in, in the Ottoman system, the whole system was under Sharia. I mean, it was, a, you know, it was a, not a fundamentalist, you know, Saudi Arabian version of Sharia. It was more of a, you know, mainstream Sharia. Right. But, uh, but they also allowed a certain degree of autonomy for all these different, you know, other, other religions, basically, Christians and Jews and all that, as well as the different tribes and clans that sort of had their own customary systems of law. 
and I can, I see America moving more like that in the future. You know, where it's okay, the uh, you know, say so, so the gods, lightning militia guys. You know, they've got their own code, and the you know, the Grateful Dead hippie tribe or whatever that we call it today. I guess they, I guess they're not really into the Grateful Dead now. That's old. What would they be into now? Fish or something like that? <laughs> right. That's probably yeah. old now too. Yeah. <laughs> the Kanye West uh, Jesus <laughs> yeah. King tribe. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> Saw that yesterday. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm a tribalist. I think there's a lot of anarchists that go super hyper individual, and they forget that people are going to want to be part of groups. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of weird because then they say, "Well, then you're a collectivist." And I was like, "Oh, I got collectivist like when state forces you to become a Russian." Um, Whereas before that, you were like a Ukrainian or something like that, right? Part of a different identity. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, tribalism is good. Shared customs, uh, traditions, uh, values are good. Uh, and not everyone wants to be part of your tribe, right? I think collectivism differentiate from that. Well, how would you differentiate collectivism from tribalism then, right? Well, those are loaded terms because you can have compulsory collectivism, right. which, which most people from the political right are that. Most people from the political right... Are, you know, like a lot of the right denounces the left. They say, well, the left are collectivists, which most of them are. Most leftists are yeah. collectivists. They're socialists and communists and all of that. But, the, uh, but so are most people on the right. Most yeah. people on the right are nationalists or, or you know, theocrats or, or some, they favor some kind of class supremacy or racial supremacy or religious supremacy or something like that. So most of them are collectivists as well. They just want a smaller collective. You know, it's like, we don't care about this universalist system, citizen of the world collectivism, you know, one world government. We just want a big... Big continental government, right? Yeah. Right. Well, like when uh, when Catalonia wants to uh, secede, you know, they they have like a national identity, you yeah. know, and so there's some nationalism involved. You wonder for groups like that. I, I I worry for the guy who's living in that territory but doesn't agree with you know the average Catalan person, yeah. and and so he says, "Oh crap, you know, you're seceding." Well, I'm I'm now part of your secessionary movement, whether I like it or not, right? Right, yeah, uh, and that tends to happen. Um, well, in the case of the Catalonians, I tend to think that basically all their, what, what that amounts to is the Catalans are trying to be another province of the European Union. They just don't want to be part of Spain. And the Scottish National Party is the same way. Like Scotland right. has this national independence thing, but they want, they want to be part of the EU. They just want to be part of the UK. Uh, so it's, they're not really, you know, they're just replacing the, you know, the, the yeah. disease with the, the other disease or whatever. Don't you think that gets them closer to realizing their own tribe, though? Yeah, potentially, potentially. I mean, you know, there's this big debate about, you know, among people who think as I do, uh, about, well, is is this a step in the right direction? Or or is it just a waste of time? Or, you know, is it a a distraction? Or is it regression? And, And, yeah, it could be a step in the direction of saying, well, you know, let's say the Catalans become an independent you know, nationality or whatever, but they're still part of the whole EU apparatus. Maybe they eventually decide, well, you know, this sucks too, you know. Right. So maybe they can be, would come out, you know, they start the cat exit or whatever they would call it. Right. <laughs> they, they see, uh, but at least other uh, provinces would see, well, if Catalan can do it, why can't we? All right. If Quebec ever separated from, like, Canada, uh, the states here would be like, well, why, why can't we? Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. I think the more the merrier, the more competition with state in terms of like tax incentives for its populace will kind of pull and weave like uh, the interests of like freer markets, I'm thinking. Yeah, well, it's good when political rulers have incentives, incentives to give people a reason to stay. Where, right. yeah. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> where, where they're not driving away their whole population. Uh, yeah, uh, so, well, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff like this on an international level. There's actually a lot of, uh, if you look around the world, there's a lot of different kinds of movements that want to be independent of whatever it is they're dependent on now. You know, it's, uh, I mean, there's well-known ones like, you know, there's the Tibetans and the, you know, Uyghurs and the, you know, Palestinians, Kurds and all of that. But there's plenty of others, including people, you know, most of us have never heard of. Uh, you know, there are literally thousands of movements like that all over the world. So, you know, it's, uh, it would be interesting. I, I know people who want to create an international or, you know, secessionist movement. It's like, all right. Yeah. And they, then you get into the definition of, well, what's the question of, well, what's the definition of a true secessionist? <laughs> so uh, pan-anarchism happens. Uh, Keith Preston is here in Virginia. Uh, would, what would be the name of your tribe, or what kind of tribe values would you look into being a part of? Oh, I, I've been asked that before, and uh, I don't really have a clear answer to that. Because uh, one thing, I'm not going to be here to see it, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, well, how soon do you think the dollar will collapse? Uh, well, I, uh, I don't know. That's an interesting question there. I think, I think the dollar's going to hold out for a while, actually. Yeah, me too. But, uh, 
Yeah, I, uh, I, I actually have fairly moderate opinions about a lot of things. Like I'm, one thing that's interesting is that I don't really belong to a lot of the cultural extremes. You know, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not a, a white nationalist or any of that. You're stuff. like Switzerland. Or, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm like I'm Switzerland. Basically. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm not a religious fundamentalist or a white nationalist or you know any any of that stuff. And I'm not uh, a social justice warrior, or antifa or. or a, a Marxist Leninist and that stuff either. So I'm, you know, in terms of cultural affiliation, I'm somewhere in the middle. Yeah, it's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not even opposed to mainstream culture that much. Like I, I said one time, if some, if I'm ever sentenced to death for sedition, my last meal will probably be Pizza Hut or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not that, you know, of a, that, I'm, you know, I, I never, I never, yeah, I never was really into the cultural radicalism. Like I was never into the vegans and the. You know the organic foods. I'm not. I'm not opposed to that, but it's. I was never into that stuff. It's and okay I, to be opposed to that. <laughs> and uh, and I, I never was into whatever the parallels to that on the right would be either. Yeah, you know, like, I would say obviously you would go if it's a pro Western cultural tribe, right? Versus being somewhere that uh, has surreal law. Yeah, yeah, probably right? so. Yeah, I think um, the West pretty much will adopt whatever it finds the most value out of, right. or the most. Whatever they value, if that might be convenience or whatever, it's just like this is where you can have freedom of speech, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a big thing for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I use that a lot. Right, and uh, maybe right to bear arms. There's not a lot of countries in the world that has that. Yeah, that's interesting. The United States, uh, I think, I think we we're talking about this before the program. The United States has the most liberal, quote unquote, liberal in the classical sense gun laws of about any nation, I think. And certainly culturally, something yeah. like half of all firearms that are in circulation, private firearms that are in circulation worldwide are in the United States. Known so, firearms. Yeah, known firearms. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. So, yeah. so you've got, um, you've got uh, and it's, it, obviously there are cultural reasons for that. It comes from the legacy of having once been a frontier society. Um, so, but you have this, you know, deeply ingrained gun culture that's just uh, sort of a check on on state power in a way that's just, you know, a matter of tradition. And you have the same, you have comparable cultural phenomena in other societies. For instance, in an Islamic society, the head of state can't just come out and say, "Well, this is Islam thing that sucks. You know, we're going to forget about that." You know, no, you, you know, <laughs> you're finished. Uh, and and that's it, the gun culture is kind of like that in the United States in the sense that you mm. know, whenever somebody like uh, what's his name Beto or York or whatever is saying Robert. we're going to confiscate everybody's <laughs> guns, yeah, you know, well, well, no, he's not. He's going to have some real problems if he tries to do that. You know, right. So, I mean, yeah, they, it's, it's weird when people say like, well, England should just get guns. Like that's not even their culture. Yeah. Maybe they should go back to swords, but <laughs> telling them to like uh, adhere to like more gun policies, like they don't really have that in part of ingrained as their cultural background and history and. It's not something that would have kind of helped them achieve better freedom or better place. Well, I've had this conversation with Europeans before, and, and they'll say, you know, people from places like the Netherlands or, or Sweden or Germany and some of those, and they're like, we just don't get your gun culture. You know, that's right. just, that's just, we just can't relate to them. Like, well, of course, because you're not us. Right. <laughs> when Australia says that, it's like, yeah, of course, you guys were founded by criminals. <laughs> we don't want you to guys have any guns anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want you shooting any kangaroos. Right. I like kangaroos. So we're wrapping up here in the last uh, minute here. You guys have any other questions? You know, we, we covered a lot of topics. I mean, it's just a pre I appreciate having you on the show, though. I and mean, it's been a, a great opportunity to talk. So definitely would like to have you at uh, Anarchon oh. uh, for next year as a speaker. Um, when and where is that? <laughs> uh, it's up in uh, Winchester. Okay. Uh, next year, we're uh, projected to have over 100 anarchists there, oh. libertarians. Uh, there's a gun range there. There's, there's, there's everything there. So we kind of camp out there for two or three days and uh, out in the woods and the mountains and just kind of celebrate uh, liberty. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for coming on. So where can we find more of your information? Uh, well, you can go to the website, attackthesystem.com, just like it sounds. Um, and that has a lot of stuff on it. It's, uh, that website's been up for about 20 years. So it's got... Uh, probably hundreds of essays I've written and, and thousands of blog posts. And I've gotten about half a dozen books. You can access those from the, from the website. Oh, nice. We can access how to order them on the website. And if you just Google my name, Keith Preston, you can find all kinds of stuff you know, about me. Just do a massive Google search and you can find what people who don't like me say. About 
<laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show. For those listening, stay liberated. Get off my property. If they keep printing money, we'll keep printing guns. Dave's fault. <laughs>